Bandwidth provided by Recursive Squirrel Interactive. Visit them on the web at recursivesquirrel.com. Episode 560, Watch More TV. Monday, September 23rd, 2019. It's time for this week's edition of The Beancast, a weekly discussion about the news and issues facing marketers today. I'm your host, Bob North. Thanks for joining us. The ad industry has always negated advertising effectiveness studies by insisting on the largely unattributable metric of brand value creation. So have we been right to do so? Or have we just been fooling ourselves? Tonight we'll discuss the latest research. Also a suggested process for replacing the RFP, the role for Facebook groups in social strategy, dealing with the climate change issue, Plus, the good, the bad, and the ugly. That's the lineup. Let's meet tonight's panel. Thanks for joining us for this week's Beancast. I'm Bob Norp, and with me on the panel for this evening, we start with the CEO of both Artisanal Agency and Twit.tv, Ms. Lisa, Lisa Laporte. Lisa, hi, how are you? Hi, Bob. Thanks for having me back. Oh, my pleasure. Now, next, he's the co-host of the always informative marketing podcast, Marketing Over Coffee, plus partner at Trust Insights, Mr. John J. Wall. Hi, John. Hey, Bob. Glad to be back. And finally, we have the executive vice president of advanced media at Viacom. Say hello to Mr. Julian Zilberbrand. Hey, Julian. Hey, Bob. Excited to be back. Glad that you all can make it. It's a great show this evening, at least in my mind, because I've scripted it out, and I think it's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> First up on the agenda, a new research paper presented findings from a study regarding the effectiveness of advertising. While the study primarily focused on uh, TV in terms of what it was researching, the conclusions about all brand advertising were not really that good. They even went so far as to suggest that brand advertising may even result in negative impressions, which I'm not sure how that works, but apparently it does. So, Lisa, what are your opinions about the study as a whole and how, if at all, should the industry respond to it? Well, you know, this was a really interesting read when I went through it because I'm also in the process of helping a bunch of our direct response advertisers on Twit TV look at their spend for next year in digesting everything they've done in this current year. I think they fell short by only sticking to TV commercials and their effectiveness based on response within the area. I think that's a huge mistake because the reality is, is if you don't need to go to the store and you don't need to buy that brand, particularly right then, there may not have been you know, an impact from it. Because if you read the report, towards the end of the report, one of the things they did point out was that for about half of all brands, the observed advertising spend had a positive return over no advertising spend. So if you're only gauging the immediate response of somebody actually going out to a store and making an actual purchase right then, I think it's a huge miss. Um, when I was researching this last night, I came across a quote and I just laughed when I read this because it makes sense to me. Doing business without advertising is like winking at a girl in the dark. You know <laughs> what you're doing, but no one else does. The reality <laughs> is brands need to advertise. But if they're only looking at TV, it's a huge mistake. I mean, the reality is audiences are fragmented. Well, let me, let me to... stop you there for a second. There, this idea that brands uh, need to advertise, but they shouldn't necessarily look only at TV – um, I'm not so sure that's always the case. I mean, when you're talking about a big brand like McDonald's or Geico, I mean, they may not be able to correlate directly from the commercial that they're getting call volume in as a result of the commercial. But you do know that if you take those ads off television, you have same store, you know, you, know, you have drops in, in actual profitability that are measurable, even though you can't right. attribute it to the advertising. 
Agreed. I believe there's that as well. But the problem is you're not grabbing kids anymore. You're not getting the Gen Zs. You're not getting the millennials. If you asked my son what a Geico commercial was, he's 17, he'd look at you and say, what's Geico? He right. has no you know, idea of it. So I think TV you know, advertising, I, I'm not saying you shouldn't do it, but in addition to being on TV, you really need to be on a plethora of different markets because everybody's consuming content differently. Um, I'll be honest with you. I'm a 50-year-old woman. I don't watch TV except for sports and maybe some live events. So for Frankly, for when I want to find out, you know, who's advertising where, I'm looking at podcast ads, I'm looking at social media ads, I'm looking, you know, along the lines of everything. So I think this case study fell short in that they were looking for like a direct response within the, you know, the framework of where these commercial ads went. And I think the reality is, is if you don't need that particular product right then, you're not going to run out and buy it. Maybe you put it on your list and you consider it. And, and think about this. If, let's say, it's Coca-Cola, you walk into a store, a grocery store, and Coca-Cola is $7 for a case. And then you look to the right of Coca-Cola, and their brand is 3 4 $7. You may just go with the other brand because of cost. Mm. So I think there's a lot more that goes into this than just that particular response. But I think it's a sheer miss to say that it's, it's, it's a negative impact. I find that hard to believe. I think it could be timing. It it could be people aren't looking for that particular product right then and there. And if they stop doing it, like you said, you'll see more of the negative impact of it. So, so it, you know, I, I just think it, it falls short in just looking at one medium. Um, that was just really my interpretation of going through the case study. Well, there's also the fact that it's just like it looked at big brands. From what I could tell, I mean, uh, from the study, it looked mainly at the effect, impact and effect on big brands. Um, and not really looking at what's happening with the smaller brand marketing and how TV can impact them. And I'm not really sure whether or not that would be a good play for a smaller brand to do something on television or not. Um, let's go to the TV expert, why don't we, who's probably chomping at the bit. Um, Julian, what's your thoughts on all this? I mean, <laughs> well, <laughs> let's begin with the very basic kind of like feeling that I got from reading the study. Um, it's flawed and you can certainly look for holes in any study and make any study, you know, sing a song that you want it to sing. Oh, I, I forgot to give, I forgot to give our usual disclaimer. We always take studies with a grain of salt. That's yes, been it, on the it, Beancast it, it, since year one that we've been doing that. <laughs> little in, disclaimer. Indeed, indeed. And, and look, the, the reality is, is it's always more complicated than, you know, one factor uh, in terms of whether or not you're using a certain medium to achieve a specific goal. I think in every marketing uh, aspect, or when in every aspect as you're looking at thinking about marketing to people, you need to look at you know, a multi-touch approach, right? You need to look at multiple channels and, and, have a, and work through a consumer through their journey of how they're consuming content. But to even, you know, to even suggest that television provides a negative return on investment is, is laughable at, at best. Uh, and almost uh, insulting <laughs> at worst. Uh, truthfully, uh, TV has an immense value in, in ultimately how you're, uh, how you're defining TV, whether you're talking about you know, pure broadcast investment uh, or through OTT or CTV or any other channel where consumers consuming content on that big screen. Uh, there's you know, uh, hundreds of studies that prove what the value that brings to clients. Now, again, depending on what you're trying to achieve with your marketing objective, uh, certain mediums provide distinct value that others don't. And, you know, when you're looking at a study of that nature, I feel like, you know, it, it doesn't give a, a full view of how a marketer should be looking at a medium such as TV, which is obviously a very large reach medium and, and focused on, you know, awareness much more than immediate direct response. John, what's your take on this? Before we move on and talk a little bit more in depth about the study in particular, what were your thoughts about the findings of the study and the impact and whether or not TV was overplayed? Yeah, it's interesting. You know, I had a chance to talk to Professor Shapiro about a year ago as he was doing the research. And I, the interesting thing to me was the whole research side of it, you know, the way that they were actually running ads and they had certain TV markets where you know, they could literally have the ad run on one side of the street and not on the other and be able to, you know, get a view of what was going on and how much it was affecting stores within certain regions. So, it, I mean, it was really impressive in that it was kind of bringing a level of data analysis to TV advertising that nobody else had been doing at that time. But then on the other hand, it's, uh, you know, 
getting this kind of tracking has been over on digital forever now. And it, that's kind of more the way to go. And then between that and the rise of subscription and over the top TV stuff, it's just, I, you know, it's kind of, I just don't see daytime TV being the right fit for lots of brands. You know, I, I mean, there are, there's definitely businesses that can make huge money off of it, but it's kind of if, if all the options are open to you, TV is going to be pretty low on the list of things you're going to take a shot at. Well, that's a day part issue, right? When it comes down to it, day parts are not all effective with the same type of advertising. I mean, Julian, you'll back me up on this. I mean, you, it's like you, you pr prime time is great for branding. And if you're going through daytime or late at night, you want to be doing more direct response type ads. What are you trying to achieve? What is your objective when using the medium? If you're looking at it, from that perspective, the medium can serve its value. Uh, if you're looking for a specific objective, then perhaps uh, you know you have to d distinguish between what you're trying to achieve and, and what the medium is really good at. And to look at it any other way is somewhat negligent if you're a marketer. You know, one of the things about this study, we, and we've talked about it to a certain extent already here in this in this discussion, the majority of the criticism about the findings points that, to the fact that they were only looking at sales effectiveness and not the softer brand value derived from ads. Lisa, is that just the tired old excuse of advertising or is it a valid point in this case? I mean, you know, that's always the excuse of advertising, that it's just, you know, we're you know, we're not, you're not measuring the brand value, but how do you measure attribution of brand value? It's, it's like such a loose metric that's so difficult to pin down. You know, I've always struggled with this too, with people that come on our podcast network and they they want to push their brand out there, but then they want to minimize the impact of how many positions that they're buying. So the reality is, is I, I think, you know, People I talk to when they hear ads, they're like, oh, yeah, I heard this ad on this and I heard this ad on this. And they've kind of ignored the brand. And then I'll find out later that, oh, they then they tried it two or three months later. So I think there is that soft brand value that comes out of any type of advertising that people need to hear things anywhere from seven to 15 times before they're even going to consider it. So if you're only looking for direct response, depending on how many ads you're going to run on TV, et cetera, then looking at the impact of just the local stores around them that they're buying, I, I, I think that also falls short. People can buy things on Amazon. People can go elsewhere to get this, or they may tell a friend about it who's buying it in a completely different state. So I, I, I think you can't ignore that. I think there is that brand value. People keep hearing something. They keep you know, considering a brand, and then perhaps one day they're going to go out and try it. You know, my question about that always comes back to, is that a reach and frequency story or is that brand advertising? In other words, um, wouldn't they be just as effective in the end if they ran a whole bunch of direct response ads and just allowed those direct response ads to work hard, but at the same time create brand value as opposed to going straight out there with only a brand value proposition? I tell brands to do that all the time. I'll be honest with you. Some people are like, I just want to get my brand out there. And I'm like, hey, why don't you give people 10% off if they, you know, let's say it's a SaaS, you know, company, if they buy something for a year, give them that additional thing. So you really focus on it just being brand and DR could be like a, a sub set to that, or you focus on trying to sell one aspect of your company as DR, and then also have some things about your brand there too. And if people go to a landing page or, you know, if they see the TV commercial and they go and check out a website or they call in, maybe there's different things that they can find there. I, I think both are, are highly effective. And I usually, you know, recommend both to any particular client. What do, you, what do you know? Creative actually matters. Who, who would have thought? <laughs> you know what? And that's, I think, the emphasis on, you know, going through this case, this case study and seeing all these analytics and everything. I think people are forgetting the human nature that's involved and also the messaging that goes behind it. Because I've seen ads fail. They're terrible ads. I mean, the ad fell five. Come on, Bob. That was your that was your mark for the longest time. But the reality is, is if the messaging doesn't work, then it won't matter you know, how it's playing. Cause that's something I really focus on with our brands. They send us ad copy and the ad copy, no offense, half the time is crap. And you're like, let's critique this to be something that would be more engaging to an audience. The, if the creative is trash, then the medium is somewhat irrelevant, regardless of what, what medium you're using. If the creative is quality and, and it's built for and taking advantage of what the medium offers, then you should have the desired result. John, you know the study author, as you mentioned. So there was another thread of complaint I found on a, on a posting of this particular study. 
that um, the findings aren't all that new. That One person talked about a study that was conducted in the 70s that had eerily similar aspects in terms of their findings to the findings that this study had. What, what drove this study in the end? Is it just kind of an iterative thing or is it, was it really trying to you know, push the envelope in terms of understanding of what's going on in the advertising market? Yeah, well, there's definitely, you know, again, the data collection side of it was big, too. But I think it, it just showcases an interesting difference between academia and the market, too, in that in academia, for them to say that, you know, 70% of the stuff out there is at best doing nothing or causing damage. Whereas when you go to a business and you say, look, you run some stuff, there's a 30% chance you're going to crush it. That sounds like a great game to be playing in for most people in business. So you know, there's definitely something there with um, you know, your kind of odds of success. And another interesting thing that came out of that too, which I think they were digging for, I, I didn't really get the whole story, but the fact that they were trying to look at the stuff that was successful and what can you glean from that. And they didn't come up with any statistically significant stuff as far as the stuff that worked. Like there, there wasn't anything they could say about these are the ones that works and here's what you can copy. So, it, you know, it's just it's like we've talked about, it appears that there's still just a ton of magic and creative. And if you're great and creative, that can make it happen for Go you. Go figure. There's no formula for advertising success. So. <laughs> Just... No, you know what? What was interesting too in this report was that one thing that was a conclusion based on looking at a few of the other, uh, you know, mediums that they were looking at was that there was an overall decline in TV advertising effectiveness over the last three decades as a whole, mm. and I think that has to do too with just how everybody's consuming media. It's different now. It's not everybody sitting in front of a TV show and talking about it on Monday morning, you know, at, at work. So. I, I think it's um, it's a mix of that as well as uh, it could just be oversaturation, you know, with the the tons of commercials that are on TV now. You know, Julian, one other thing that came up in the comments section of this site that I was looking at, they talked a lot about the programmatic aspect of advertising and how programmatic ads are so much more effective because they're targeting and they're much more involved with the actual customer intent and they're they're driving sales, et cetera. Is, is, is that the same argument in terms of what advertising's value is? Because, I mean, it, well, programmatic ads are fu serving two functions. And it goes back to that initial complaint that I just voiced, that if we're going out with something that works hard as a, a workhorse, doing both direct and creating brand value, isn't that a better solution? And uh, we have programmatic to prove it. Well, I think when you when you talk about the construct of programmatic, what we're talking about is are you using data or information to make conscious decisions about where you're placing your ad? Right. And the com and the combination of good creative and good placement should yield better results. This is pretty logical stuff. Now, again, when I think people oftentimes misappropriate programmatic and in, in, in what its use case is, but ultimately, if you're thinking about whether or not you want to make advertising addressable, many times that has an immense value for any marketer because you can have that opportunity to have a so-called one-on-one conversation with that audience. And I think that brings immense value for a brand. At the same time, addressability is not necessarily always what you want to be using because you want to sometimes use you know, your ability to use mass reach to, to develop a brand or to create some kind of story or to drive large scale uh, you know, emotion within, the, the, within your cons you know, desired consumer base. So you know, truthfully, yes, programmatic or, and or data driven is always going to be a valuable commodity, but also oftentimes comes at you know, a cost uh, that may or may not make sense for depending on what your strategy is trying to achieve. Well, great discussion. I really wanted to get into this topic. The study captured my eye and captured my imagination this week. Uh, I think you guys gave me some, some good insights. But I'm going to move on now and talk a little bit about what a Canadian group is proposing as a means of getting rid of the RFP. And the Institute of Communication Agencies, which is a Canadian ad industry group, has put forward a new process for agency selection by brands that they're saying will help them move away from the much maligned RFP process. Now, the proposal focuses on needs and capabilities rather than creative shootouts and cost gouging. Sounds like a perfect world for the agency to exist in. Julian, is this a legitimate proposal or is this just wishful thinking on the part of an agency group? <laughs> 
I think it's using a different acronym to, to do the same thing. Um, look, if, if the suggestion is think about how you're approaching um, your selection process with any possible uh, endeavor, in this case, finding an agency, uh, and have some you know, thoughtfulness about what you're determining is the factor with which you make your selection, then that seems like very logical scenario. But I've been through that process, both of selecting an agency and then being the agency that's being selected. And being on either side of the equation, um, you know, it's, it's kind of silly to say that you, can't you shouldn't take price into the equation because I believe the article spoke to, you know, taking the price value down to zero and applying that, that score value to some other factors. And I think that's naive. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, you have a budget and you have to work within the constraints, you know, the financial constraints that are available to you. However, having it be a solely driven by, you know, the cheapest vendor or whatever that kind of point process is, uh, is also um, irresponsible. So, you know, the, their idea of, of specifically using different KPIs that determine how you make your selection, that seems very, very logical. To call it something other than an RFP is a little bit kind of uh, insulting to the intelligence. Yeah, there's something about this that it was it was so well thought out and everything except for the price consideration. You know, as soon as you read the price consideration, for me, all this other great stuff that they came up with just shut off in my head and I went, what? <laughs> you, can't, actually, you can't cut that out. You can't you, you cut that be. out. You know, it's just like they're basically, this is a veiled attempt to try to, not even a very good veiled attempt to get rid of procurement from the process. And I'm like, that's just not going to work. It's not going to work. Uh, look, ultimately, again, you, you have to take price into consideration. You have to look at, you know, what you can and cannot spend in the process of selecting a partner. However, whether or not that needs to be the ultimate decision-making factor and whether or not that's ultimately how your organization, whether that's procurement driven or otherwise, are looking to make a selection as a vendor, obviously you can be negligent in your approach if that's the only factor. However, I don't know and I have very rarely experienced where that's been the main driving factor of making a decision. Oftentimes you're looking for the right partnership, you're looking for the right ideas, you're looking for the right chemistry, and all those are factors in helping make a decision. And price, you know, all things being considered is, you know, probably number four or five on the list of things that you want to look at, but you certainly can't take it out altogether. John, I know you've worked on both sides of this coin. I mean, you, you're you just like Julian in that way. You've worked on the agency or representative side of the of the equation and also on the on the client side. So what is your thoughts about some kind of proposal that takes the RFP process and kind of turns it on its head? Yeah, I'm open to anything. That would be great. <laughs> you know, <laughs> anything that gets away from the RFP process. I don't, it just seems to me like RFP is something out of the 50s, you know, and um, uh, there were just some great points about, you know, creativity, making sure it's a fit, making sure it's the right team. I, you know, all the great places that I've seen that buy, the, the spreadsheet doesn't factor into it. There's just so many other things that go into choosing a, a successful partner that, yeah, yeah, I'm open to anything that, because even it's just such a joke too for some big brands when they send these out. You know, there's some summer intern who's filling out the spreadsheet who, you know, God knows what they're putting in there. But but it's still an RFP. You could call it a different you know three letter acronym, but it's still a, it's still an RFP. Yeah, you're <laughs> so, essentially yeah. requesting a proposal. Um, I, I'd like to see the RFP get brought to the you know 21st century i feel like it's so 1950s like we were just talking about and the reality with these is that unfortunately they they're not flexible they're very inflexible they want you to follow it in their format and i really think they are missing the creative aspects which is we actually send out something that's a little different than an rfp to people we actually include like creative what we feel you know things will attain you know with a client before we really start talking about price because i think if you don't get somebody excited about what you can offer and the audience reach you have, then it doesn't matter what it costs. I think I think there needs to be a correlation between those two. So their attempt was great, but you're right. At the end of the day, you still need the price to it. It would just be better if RFPs had more flexibility or a couple of different formats because the reality is they don't apply for everybody. I would have appreciated if the article said, can we update the RFP process? Can we change it? Not to give it a, a different name for the same thing. Agreed. <laughs> Let me ask this question for, for just of the group, and I could start here with Julian. Um, Julian, what, what is the one biggest problem in the current RFP process? Is it the, the 
the giving away of creative ideas that aren't going to be recompensed? Is it the is it the procurement angle where the price becomes such a central component? What what's your biggest problem with the part current process? Um, it's a good question. Uh, I, I think oftentimes the, one of the biggest issues is, you know, to their point and to the article's point, is sometimes some of these things are more procurement driven than they should be. Um, although, again, in my experience, that, that certainly hasn't been the main issue. I, I don't know that there is a specific problem that you can generalize for the marketplace. I think, you know, depending on the organization and depending on the people responsible, there's lots of ways to do this thoughtfully and to do this strategically without it being, uh, you know, without it being fully based on one single factor. And I think, you know, in a lot of cases that's seen. But certainly I can call out, and I think you're fair to call out, Bob, the fact that you know, you do share a whole host of creative ideas that you have no uh, no access to and to get used against uh, will get basically stolen from you through the RFP process. And that certainly is a little bit of a challenge. Uh, and I guess that would be if I had to pick one, I might choose that as the single biggest concern for anybody even participating in the process is knowing simply that even if you come with a good idea, it could simply get taken and repurposed. Lisa and John, do you have similar thoughts as far as the RFP process or in terms of what's wrong with it currently? Or is there something else you can point to that you really find to be a particularly irksome part of this? Um, I find them to be way too generic. I mean, huge agencies will reach out to us and send us a mound of paperwork. You can't speak to anybody for clarity. You can't offer suggestions or ideas. Otherwise, it, I mean, you do, but then it just goes off and there's no response back half the time. So for me, honestly, when I read this, I kind of groaned. I'm like, RFPs, I just really don't like to have them without conversations. <laughs> so I agree. They can steal your ideas. I mean, I've put together some tremendous, some, uh, we spent a lot of time on RFPs with some of these huge agencies and you can't ever speak to somebody. And then I hear the ads being run later and I'm like, oh yeah, those were some of my ideas <laughs> that we had given to them, oh. but there's nothing you can do about it. And the reality is I may not have been the only one, but I just find them to be very uh, generic. Um, I, it, it's, it's like do all this work and there's no feedback and there's really no point of contact to have. So typically when I get an RFP, if it's with a large agency and it's for a pretty, it's for a qualified brand that would fit our network, I will actually take the time to try to hunt down a person and have a conversation with them and, and do a deeper dive. Like, okay, you sent me your one little page on terms and what your objectives are, but there's like, it, there's usually missing data and other points that you'll want to have from them. So typically if you can get somebody on the phone and have a conversation and then able to critique the RFP to fit our product, then it's it's not a bad thing. But I really feel like, you know, you can complete, you know, hundreds of these, get zero feedback, and your ideas go somewhere else. Mm. Jo John, <laughs> um, is, is an effort like this even worth it in the first place? I mean, here we have an industry group that's representing agencies, putting forward a new process for brands to follow in terms of creating an RFP. Sounds really cheeky to me, you know? It seems like if... The, it seems like the process should have started with the brands themselves, but at the same time, you, you got to give them credit for at least thinking about the process. So <laughs> is it is it worth the time and effort to do something like this, to propose to the brands a new way to do the RFP? Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, I think it is because I fall squarely into just the belly aching camp of, you know, just as Jillian talked about procurement driven and then Lisa nailed the, you know, vendors abusing their power to make you do unnatural acts. I mean, that's this whole thing. But rather than complain about it, to at least try and pitch something that might work. But yeah, I'm uh, again too uh, old and jaded for to think that you know somebody from uh, some huge large corporation is just waiting for this to change their process on them. I, I don't <laughs> see that happen. Well. I don't think they're ever going to solve this problem. I've talked about this so many times on the show from different angles. Every potential angle has been covered here at this point. It seems like there's no solution to the RFP process. We're just going to have to suck it up and deal with it, I think. Well, I've always advocated that Facebook groups were the hidden brand marketing treasures of the Facebook ecosystem. Um, and it seems that most of the social media strategists out there pretty much agree with me. Um, John, what, what do you believe is at the heart of this ongoing affection toward the tool? I mean, this article that I posted, I, I believe it was from Adweek, was just glowing in terms of um, reports and stories about how social media managers have effectively leveraged Facebook groups 
to have conversations of meaning and note with their customers. Um, wh- what makes it such a powerful tool? <laughs> well, because they've so abused anybody that just had generic Facebook <laughs> that, that, you know, suddenly it's, it's just the, it's such the model. This is how it works. You know, they open it up organically. Everybody's going to get in these groups. And then a year and a half from now, everybody's going to be talking about how you're going to have to pay X bucks a month to get access to your Facebook group. So I, this is the forgotten, but this is the forgotten backwater of Facebook. I mean, nobody thinks about it. And you know, you, uh, most of the groups out there are not even from brands, but the brands who are using them are just doing phenomenal work with their customers. But the, the trouble is it's not at scale. I mean, it's, it's not a scalable, meaningful type of network. It's just this small little group of select segments of your audience, right? Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, there's there's other things going with that. I mean, one is velvet rope communities, you know, like having to be invited into these groups. I mean, some of these can be throttled pretty well. It's a challenge for a brand just to even get in the door sometimes. Mm. And then and then this is, you know, it becomes uh, influencers, general influencers are blocked out too, right? You can't just buy big names to get into these people if they're not in the groups. They've got to be in the groups now. So there's another hurdle against generic influencers. Again, all shoveling money towards the ad model. Huh. I mean, I think it's niche. I mean, if you think about it, it's just another way to really cultivate an audience, like a chat room or something small like that. And I'm in a couple and, you know, I'll admit I'm in a few things. I collect jewelry. So I'm in an Etsy group. I have a few Facebook groups that I'm in and I actually like it because then you get to see like new things coming out, new handmade, you know, clothing, things like that, that I'm really interested in. So to me, it's just a great way for me to participate with a brand on a level that I like. And it's very small. They're niche. They're not really large, you know, groups, but I think it's, it's just, it's like, why not? I don't think huge brands are going to break into it, but it's really great for smaller, you know, homegrown brands, I think. Yeah, well, and vetted audiences too, you know, you, you're kind of the, your crazy uncle's not in there. Right. It, it's nice, tight targeting, and there certainly is a value to niche. Uh, at the same time, just buy TV, so much better. <laughs> yeah, coming from the TV guy. You know, Julian, on that note, I mean, are, are groups always effective or is it just a matter of the right product, right audience type scenario? Uh, it's definitely right product, right audience, right time. So, right the, you know, it, the, it's already been said, I mean, I think, I think it was Lisa who said that they're probably more effective for small brands rather than big brands. But how does a big brand potentially use a Facebook group? I mean, what's the scenario where the strategy aligns with, you know, of what Facebook groups offer to people? I mean, certainly you could use it to, to kind of spread your social message and agenda, and agenda and to use, you know, use your kind of power in that space uh, to speak to a specific set of people that might be responsive to that kind of messaging. So certainly there's lots of different ways even big brands can kind of get involved in that. But, you know, certainly um, it might make more sense if you're looking at smaller brands who are looking for a direct response, speak to a niche audience that are, 100% engaged with what they're trying to sell. As far as I can tell from all the Facebook group tools that I've worked with, there's no there's no tool on Facebook for you to segment out your audience and get to the right audience on Facebook. However, there are lots of opportunities to use other networks that have more opening open questioning like uh, say Twitter or um you know, Insta- not even Instagram. I mean, it's just like some place that's more open in terms of the communication structure. And then you can invite people to come back to a Facebook group if you want to have them to be part of some private conversation. Um, for me, that's about the only way you can do this, right? There's no way, there's no built-in tool, John, on the network itself that helps you to segment out the audience and have a conversation of meaning and note with, say, your influencer group or your creators. I'm, I'm going back to this social technographics ladder that Forrester put out, you know, this idea that every rung on the ladder is a different level of engagement from the user and a different value to the brand. So if that's the case, how do you do that? What's the, the primary way that you would recommend to a client in terms of how to manage this 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 very different audience level in terms of having a conversation with them. 
Yeah, well, to, I mean, you want to be bleeding that audience off all you can. You know, I mean, you always want to keep trying to hit back to your own content or your own place because, yeah, you're just on an endless game of defense. It's like, you know, new stuff gets rolled out, stuff is not supported. Maybe the API supports it, maybe it doesn't. I mean, it's just uh, as moving target as you can get. Lisa, how about you? What, what's your thoughts on that question? I mean, this idea that, you know, your audience is not all the same and you might want to give a special touch to some kind of primary portion of your audience. How do you manage to use a Facebook group to do that? Is there any way to use Facebook tools in order to make that happen? Or is it like the scenario I presented that you need to go outside the network and kind of draw them back into the tools that are available on Facebook? Um, I think there needs to be a strategy of both. You need to be outside the network as well as inside the network. It might mean that you need to run some ads in Facebook first, promoting that you're going to launch a group and make it fun and make it exciting and do something along those lines to entice Facebook users. Um, I think if you're a brand, you could say, hey, join our Facebook group. You're, you're definitely going to have to pull them in probably from your website, probably from other social media campaigns, as well as the campaigns on Facebook. I think that's the way Facebook gets you into their ecosystem. First, you got to do some ads there then you can build a group and i think it will take probably both within the app as well as you know on your own website twitter as well as other venues you know i think linkedin's a great place to go to 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 try to find quality people well moving on to our final topic of the week ad week in coordination with last week's climate uh, climate strike that was going on around the globe focused much of its content on calls for climate action within the ad world Lisa, what is the role that we should be playing as advertisers? I mean, they gave a lot of suggestions, but I'd love your personal take on what the role of advertising is in climate change awareness and how we can leverage our particular powers and skills in order to help climate change legislation to actually become a reality. Well, I mean, this is perfect. I've actually been advocating amongst my own team to hunt and look for advertisers that are eco-friendly. They use recycled glass paper. Um, they're carbon neutral. We've been actually on the hunt looking for brands like that because, you know, being in a, in a technology forward thinking environment, this is, you know, global warming is very real. It's happening. And, and as somebody that is out looking to partner with brands, I am really looking for those particular things within a group. Uh, last week, we've signed the table store, their ads start pretty soon. They're 100% carbon neutral business. They're offsetting their CO2 emissions by planting thousands of trees each year. These guys have a company come in and actually track everything they do from having their product shipped to them, to cutting their materials, to even having the product shipped out. And they do a full calculation on their business to, to remain carbon neutral. And I think, you know, us as marketers and people going out for sales, we want to find those people that are being eco-friendly, that are using recycled products that are doing something along these same lines. I mean, something that we have started personally um, on our own, you know, uh, our own um, giving back to this world. Leo and I go to, we've been going to cooleffect.org and it's a place where you can go to offset your own carbon emissions. So we do this every time we travel, every time we do something, we're constantly doing that. And as a matter of fact, I've asked them for a proposal for our own business. So I think it's going to take us leading and looking for these people that are really ready to help make a change. We can't wait to 2030. We can't wait to 2040. We've got to do something now. So, you know, I encourage everybody to either, you know, have this conversation with anybody they're approaching in the marketing world and seeing what they're doing to give back. Are they driving electric vehicles? Are they going solar? I just think it doesn't hurt to continue to promote those within your own um, outreach to bring on advertisers. Um, Julian, uh, what's your thoughts on that? I mean, Lisa puts forward some great ideas here as far as a, a company's commitment toward only accepting advertisers or looking to accept, get to a point where they're accepting advertisers from carbon neutral businesses. Um, what about, do we have a responsibility to take the clients who we currently have who maybe not, or maybe aren't carbon neutral to help them to move toward that space? Or is that completely out of our hands and not something that the media companies out there should be focused on doing to clients and trying to move them toward that direction? Look, I, I think it's a challenge to kind of force anybody to go in, in a certain direction. And I think there are questions to be asked whether or not you are, you should be doing things of that nature. On the other hand, we're talking about a very serious issue uh, and you have an opportunity to kind of 
uh, you know, use a large uh, scale voice to help spread a message that is very, very important and has an impact on all of us. So to the de degree that, you know, I wouldn't suggest any businesses uh, only do business with, with uh, you know, carbon, carbon neutral or carbon positive uh, organizations or, 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 you know, um, you know, any businesses that are, are, are focused on messaging around the environment. Uh, I don't know that you can ever kind of singularly go in that direction, at least at this point in time. But I think you can certainly uh, use, you know, a company like us, for example, can help use the reach that we have uh, to work with advertisers holistically on their messaging and hope that, you know, those businesses are, you know, thinking in that general direction and then can include messages of that nature in some of their work or companies like us often give uh, spot time to uh, to certain organizations to do PSAs and things of that nature and whether or not you should be working with uh, companies of that nature who then, you know, you give them a platform uh, to help spread a message. All of that is within the realm of possibility. I'm, I'm personally not in a, in a mode to force anybody to work in a certain manner, but if you believe that this is a major issue, then you should be putting the effort in to try to help spread the, the word uh, and to help self save lives. You know, that's a really interesting point, um, this idea of market creation. John, you know, th th in terms of responsibility from the ad community or the media world, um, are, are, sh do we have a responsibility with our voice, with our platform to always present a carbon neutral type scenario to the public, even if it's not necessarily something that the brand is all about or we're trying not trying to make any kind of statement? We're just presenting a carbon neutral type environment in the scenes that we're portraying or the types of ads that we're running in order to create a sensibility within the public at large that av that carbon neutral is a good thing and that it's acceptable and basically create a market for and uh, encourage brands to actually move in that direction in terms of their product creation. Yeah, I think it's, you know, anytime you take on any kind of socially charged topic, you just have to look and say, is this in line with our brand or not? You know, if it is in line with your brand, there's, and there's, you know, but fact, that's, that's the whole thing. That's the whole thing. I mean, what I'm talking about is not necessarily w whether it's in line with your brand or not, because I mean, the brands are not going to take responsibility for this, but advertisers as a whole, I mean, everybody in the advertising community will talk a good game about being carbon neutral and being aware of climate change and wanting to be part of the solution. But we're still doing ads, we're creating ads that are led by the brand and not necessarily always putting forward some kind of climate change messaging or some kind of carbon neutral environment in the scenario that we're creating so that it kind of seems like green is cool. And, it, you know, in a lot of ways, it's not necessarily, I, I don't know what I'm trying to say. I mean, <laughs> yeah, well, no, I, I get where you're coming from, but it's, you know, there's been more than one brand that's gone up in flames trying to be cool. Yeah, I think the general idea is, is you know, if you, you might mean well in order to try to achieve a goal, but, you know, that, that goal has to be achieved with everybody's participation and not, uh, you know, any one part of the ecosystem or any one part of the chain, um, you know, kind of force the issue. Because I think that's going to, it's going to feel like the authenticity is gone if that's the case. Um, ultimately, if you have a brand who, who wants that to be part of the messaging that they bring and is part of, you know, what the product is, then certainly, you know, uh, you know, if you can, you know, work in unison to help spread that message, I think that's a great thing. Uh, but I don't think it could ever feel forced because then it will, it will lose its value. Lisa, um, I, I'm not entirely off of this idea here, the, this idea that we have some kind of social responsibility, because there's no way that Coca-Cola came up with, a, I'd like to change, uh, give the world a Coke ad. You know, that wasn't Coca-Cola's idea. That was an ad agency going and saying, this would be really great because it puts forward a message of peace, hope, and love. And it's really in line with what a lot of your audience is thinking right here in the early 70s. So... I mean, these these led to cultural movements as a result of just an advertisement. So I'm wondering, are, do we have a social responsibility to push this climate change issue with our clients and make the kind of messaging that's going to create a market and an opportunity for these types of products to succeed? Well, my attitude is that, um, you know, this, this is going to mean the end of our world at some point if we don't start taking this seriously. So 
myself personally, I have no problems asking brands, you know, hey, are you doing anything to be carbon neutral? Are you doing anything to help, you know, cut the CO2 going out in the environment? So I ask these questions now when I go to sign people up. And and sometimes, you know, I'll be surprised. I'll be like, oh, yeah, no, we've already done this. I mean, you know, like I said, the Taylor stores in Sweden, these guys really take that into account when they're starting businesses there. It's actually part of, you know, their makeup. And my attitude is I think it needs to be part of everyone's makeup. And I'm not going to force a brand to become carbon neutral, but I'm definitely asking these questions whenever we sign anybody new. Like, what are you doing to give back to to this world? And I really think this messaging is going to grow. And I think it's really important that it's at least brought up in conversations. And I don't think you can force it down any brand's throat. But if we don't start making more and more people aware, um, you know, uh, the world as we know, it's going to be over in a couple hundred years. <laughs> It may be over in a couple hundred years anyway, no matter what we do. So it's just like you might as well make it as nice as possible on the planet before we actually have to exit for some reason. Agreed. Well, it's time for the good, the bad, and the ugly. But before we get to that segment of the show, I do want to take this quick opportunity to thank my guests again and allow them to each do a shameless plug. Starting with that voice you just heard, Lisa Laporte. You can find her at twit.tv, also at artisanalagency.com. Tell us what's going on in your world, Lisa. What would you like to promote? Well, we're super busy with 2020 upfronts. And if you're interested in advertising in the tech community, please reach out to me at lisa at twit.tv. Also pay attention to twit.tv. I have two new shows launching in the next two weeks and probably two more in the next uh, two months. So definitely stay in touch with our network. Yeah, you had some exciting hires recently, people developing all kinds of interesting shows for you over there. Yeah, we're excited. A lot, lot, a lot more short format shows are coming out, a couple longer format, but I think you'll all be excited. Great, great. Now, next up, John Wall. You can find him at trustinsights.ai and also at marketingovercoffee.com. Uh, those are his work addresses and his podcast address. So tell us what's going on in your world, John. What would you like to promote? Yeah, I'm going to be in Manhattan on Tuesday. Uh, my partner at Trust Insights, Christopher Penn, is going to be at TalkWalker talking about social networks to watch in 2020 and some of the data science stuff that we've been working on for social. So um, that's from 6 to 8 p.m. And uh, yeah, hit me up on Twitter if you'd like to come by. I can get you a ticket to get in the door. I so wish I could come. I'm teaching that night. It's not fair. I want to be at this thing. Uh, last but not least, we have Julian Zilberbrand. You can find him at Viacom.com. You may have heard of that company somewhere. So tell us, what's going on in your world, Julian? What would you like to promote? Well, as always, I'd like to promote television. That thing you know, <laughs> you love, and even if you say you don't watch it, you do. You watch it in everywhere. You watch it on the big screen. You watch it on the small screen. And specifically, please watch my channels because I very much enjoy eating at night. Thank you. My cable package now doesn't give me Paramount Channel, so I can't watch no, Ink Masters anymore. That's unacceptable. Yeah, I know. You need to upgrade terrible. immediately. Uh, no, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> As for me, for more information about me or the show, yeah, I can't believe I admitted on, on national podcasts that I watch Ink Master, but I do. I watch Ink Master. It's hysterical. As you should. It's a great program. And for more information about me or the show, visit thebeancast.com. There you can find a complete show archive. You can find out how to consult with me. And of course, most importantly, you can find out how to advertise on this program. So check it all out at thebeancast.com. And now it's time for the good, the bad, and the ugly. It's a rundown of the best and worst of advertising, marketing, and public relations from the last week. First up, the good. Lisa, the amazing job that Greta Thunberg has done to call attention to climate change is just radical. I mean, she gets on a boat. She's not only an advocate in Sweden in causing a global stirring around this issue, but then she gets into an eco-friendly boat and sails across the Atlantic in time for a rally in Times Square. I mean, this girl has done more for trying to bring climate change to, to be an issue with young people and rallying them around a cause than anything that I've seen from any advertiser or any brand or any uh, nonprofit organization. It's, it's simply stunning what's been achieved. 
I'm really ready now for brands to get behind her and, and start becoming eco-friendly and really supporting this. Uh, it's just remarkable what she's been doing. I, I just couldn't believe that she got on a boat and did this. It was just incredible. Um, I, I'm totally behind her 100%. Mm. Now, of course, with all the good, there's also a bad. Google had to remove two fully functional Chrome ad blocker extensions from their site, John, because they were basically scamming affiliate referral fees from e-commerce sites. So what happened was they used the name that was very similar to some of the popular ad blockers. You download it. It works as a fully functional ad blocker. There's nothing untoward about the ad blocking function. But meanwhile, it's registering an affiliate link at every site. So every time you went to Amazon or any of these other e-retail sites to buy something, they were collecting a little money on the back of advertisers. This was just a really great scam when you think about it. But it's an awful thing for advertisers. It, yeah, it's one of the best scams going, really, because it's... Uh, you don't want to say victimless, but it's definitely a great scam as far as you, unless somebody digs into the code hard and finds those affiliate codes in there, it's it's tough to get to. Hey, I want to say something about this, too. There's another thing that you have to be aware of. I do prep with Leo Laporte, the tech guy, so I get a little bit of feedback from him. Another thing that's been happening with uh, browser extensions is that there's well-known and trustworthy browser, browser extensions out there. Keep an eye out for when they sell, because sometimes when they sell, people do this and they manipulate them and start doing collecting money on the back end. Oh, wow. Uh, May I just yeah. say another reason why you should watch television. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, the ugly of the week. And this one was a hot debate between several ones that I was kind of finding. But this one, for me, takes the cake. We work the hottest anticipated IPO um, uh, for some time has had to lower its valuation twice since announcing their IPO, then finally had to withdraw the offer completely, Julian, as the rest of the business world started to do a little thing called math and realized that some things were not on the up and up with the uh, IPO from WeWork. I mean, I can, I, can go, I can go for hours on all the indiscretions and indis dis discrepancies and all the problems. Re reading that article with 25 or 27 points of questionable actions by uh, the gentlemen and the investors you know, over at WeWork, uh, it's a shame. That, that kind of stuff should never happen. Uh, it's unfortunate uh, for the marketplace. Uh, it's unfortunate for you know, uh, the investors. And it's, it's you know, another example of of how much more attention we have to pay to some of these companies and how they're deriving their evaluations and the due diligence we have to do holistically in the market to kind of check uh, some of these kind of corporations and, and the way that they go about doing their business and the, the, the unfortunate result of, of you know, losing public confidence in the process of doing that. I mean, some of the some of the problems are just mind boggling. My favorite, though, is the one that he owned most of the building and leased the properties back to the company. And I'm just like, wow, what a great scam. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's, it's you know, if you can get away with it, it's fantastic. But chances are you're not going to get away with it once you have to do that filing. Well, there's also the issue. I grew up in commercial real estate. The reality is, is WeWork doesn't exactly have long-term leases. So if as soon as the recession hits, like next year or the year after, people are going to start working at home. And so you virtually you have all of these empty WeWork spaces with no long-term leases. I mean, people come in, they can rent the space for a day, they could do short-term leasing. The reality is long-term, it's something I would stay away from. Well, have a suggestion to this list or just want to discuss it, comment online, use the hashtag GBU, that's pound GBU. And that does it for this week's show. If you'd like to subscribe to this podcast, visit our website at thebeancast.com and click on the subscribe link. If you're an Apple Podcast listener, we've also provided a direct link to our listing there, or just search for The Beancast in the podcast directory on the Apple Podcasts app. And whichever podcast directory you use, when you subscribe, please leave us a review. Got a comment? Have a question? We'd love to hear from you. Just send your emails to beancast at gmail.com. Opening theme was performed by Joe Seibel. Closing theme by C. Jax. Thanks for listening. I'm Bob Norp. We'll be back again next week. Hope you'll join us then.
it's just like, um, it's like, you know what I mean? It's like, it's like, like, if it's, you know what I mean? Um, I don't know, man. It's just like, okay, it's like, um, you know what I mean? Like, it's like, totally like that. It's like, uh, it's like, it's like, I don't know, like, if it's, you know, it's like, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's just like, kind of, it just seems like it's just like, almost exactly.